Welcome to the College of Knowledge. This time, blockchain technology, the rise of the decentralized economy. As the first TED speaker on blockchain, she is passionate about the convergence of technology and the impact it will have on our future. Here is Bettina Warburg. Our future economy will be much more decentralized. We all hear stories about this future, where robots are going to have wallets and their own purchasing power, where we're going to have drones that deliver products to our doorsteps, or even where we're going to 3D print finished goods or maybe our food. But it's still very hard to imagine this future, right? It doesn't come easily. And there's a good reason for that, which is we actually use the same part of our brain to imagine the future as we do to remember the past. So today, I actually want to take some time and tell some of our past stories of how we've done trade over the years in order to help you imagine a future of a decentralized economy. If you think back in time to our early agrarian days, we were in these small communities and we were able to trade with one another much more directly, one-to-one, -one, and guarantee those trades. But over time, the complexity of our societies grew, the distance in our trade grew, and we had a lot less certainty about those trades. So we built institutions. We built banks, uh, governments, different rules and marketplaces that helped codify our exchanges and lower our uncertainty about one another so that we could do business together. Eventually, if we fast forward, we put these same institutions online. We created Alibaba, eBay, Amazon, really just digital intermediaries, the middlemen that grease the wheels in our economy and allow us to trade at greater and greater scale while still lowering our uncertainty about one another. Well, today we have a new step in this evolution. Today, we can use blockchain technology to do the exact same thing, to lower our uncertainty about one another so that we can do business. So blockchain is, for me, the root of the decentralized economy. It is bringing about this next chapter. But what's very cool about it is that it actually looks a lot more like that agrarian picture. You can do trade one-to-one -one again without all of the intermediaries, but still with the lowered uncertainty. So blockchain's kind of a technocratic term, and people toss it around in innovation forums a lot. Uh, it's also sort of a buzzword. So I wanted to actually ground our conversation about blockchain in an analogy that should be pretty familiar to you. And that's the analogy of a checkbook. So when I go to write a check, I'm putting down the terms of my transaction, right? I'm going to pay you X dollars, and then I sign my name at the bottom, authenticating it. Eventually, my bank and your bank will execute that transaction and validate it based off our accounts and the numbers on the check. So we can think of this as almost a little contract. Now, if I've written all of the checks in a given checkbook, you end up with all those carbon copies, right? The little slips that represent your checks. And then at the top, you've probably filled in that little ledger of where all the checks went. In blockchain, we have something quite similar. This is basically a block of data. It is a set of transactions over the course of a certain amount of time that get lumped together and cryptographically linked to the previous set of transactions, forming a chain of events. So really, when we're talking about blockchains, we have this global ledger. But instead of the bank being the one that executes the transaction the way it would for my check, we're using all of these computers that are participating in the network to validate those transactions. So these computers are coming to agreement about what happened in a certain amount of time. And then each of them is representing that data instead of having a central administrator or a bank. Now, blockchains are in some ways similar to our modern internet. 
We have uh, public blockchains. So the Ethereum network or the Bitcoin network are public blockchains. Anyone can read or write to those blockchains. It's sort of similar to the way we use our public internet today. But there's also private blockchains, which you can think of analogously to an intranet, right? Where you have scoped the kinds of participants uh, in the system and the governance structure of that system. So the same is true for blockchain. We have these public and also private versions. Now, all of this started in 2008 with uh, the publication of a white paper that described Bitcoin as a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Since then, Bitcoin's grown to about $94 billion market cap today. And uh, what was exciting about Bitcoin then was it took this sort of check analogy further. It was used for the transfer of digital value. But we've actually expanded what blockchains can do from this original application. Now we have the Ethereum network, which generalizes how a blockchain works. And instead of just transferring financial amounts back and forth, we can actually use Ethereum to execute code. So any kinds of transactions can be executed by this set of computers that are linked together. What this means is modern day blockchains are actually global decentralized virtual computers, which is a pretty remarkable thing. Now, the tech stack for a blockchain is actually not that dissimilar to what we're used to today in our digital era. At the bottom, we have a core infrastructure. For blockchain, that's core protocols that define the network, either the Bitcoin network or Ethereum or others. We also have, uh, well, for the internet, that would be things like SMTP and TCP IP are sort of core protocols that define how we communicate. Above it, we have middleware. So different tools for communicating with that network. In blockchain, that's usually a client that allows you to write um, against the protocols. And in our current world, that's things like APIs um, or libraries. And then at the top, you have applications. Us, today, we use all sorts of applications, email, Uber, you name it. And in blockchain, we're seeing this explode. There's tons and tons of experimentation about what kinds of applications you can write to a blockchain and have decentralized. Now, the core innovation of these applications for blockchain is that they actually rely on smart contracts. So think back to that check example. It is a miniature contract. It has the terms of our business arrangement on it and how it gets executed. Right? For smart contracts, we're saying we can do the same thing. We can take anything that is business logic that we could write in the form of a contract, but we're going to write it in code. And then once it's written in code, we can essentially automate its functionality. We can automate the business logic and the governance by using this decentralized network to execute it. Now, that may all actually still sound rather far in the future. Um, but if you think back to that agrarian story, we made this big leap of trading globally by lowering our uncertainty about one another through institutions. And then we did it again when we went more digital. We expanded the realm of our trade into really much further ways, even further markets. Now we're doing that again. We're just innovating yet again and taking out some of the middlemen that would have played those trust arbiter roles. I want to go one level deeper, though, which is beyond the trade between sort of a buyer and a seller. We can actually talk about trade that's decentralizing below this. We can talk about how our goods are made. Because when a product gets made, all the way from a raw um, item all the way to a phone or some kind of consumer good, all of the transactions go into that are adding the value that this end product delivers. So people often forget this, but when we talk about decentralizing trade, we can actually talk about decentralizing all the supply chains we have, and everything has a supply chain. So we're moving into a world where how we design, make, and deliver our products is also going to decentralize. 
Now, don't get me wrong, supply chains are actually innovating in many ways, not just with blockchain technology. We have at the top sort of intelligence that's working its way into our supply chains. They're getting much smarter. We're using smart algorithms, um, machine learning, different parts of AI to make better decisions or to do forecasting in new ways of demand. We're also using the Internet of Things. We're connecting devices and sensors across so many parts of our manufacturing and our production, our logistics and transportation, so that we know all of this data about an object as it moves around the world. But this bottom layer, we actually have been missing. This bottom layer is maintaining network state, which may sound a little strange, but you can think of it as basically a shared reality. We have all of this stuff moving around the world and uh, people transacting off of it, right? But we don't have a way to connect all of that information and, and make those transfers together. We don't have a lot of trust because all of our data is siloed in different database structures. And this is what blockchain is trying to solve in many ways. It gives us a shared reality upon which even non-trusting actors can do business together because it's automating our business. So this is the key. We are getting autonomous network state because of blockchains. And autonomous network state, where we don't need to maintain it all the time, it's actually doing that on its own because it's the shared database structure, gives us machine trust. So this is sort of the story from the beginning. When we say robots are going to have wallets or drones are going to do these autonomous deliveries or even 3D printed items are going to sort of pop out of nowhere. These actually all rely in some part on an infrastructure of trade. How are all of these things and machines going to be doing trade and engaging in trade? They require machine trust. They need their own infrastructure. So how are humans going to move from sort of surviving this decentralized economy to actually thriving in it? At Animal Ventures, we get to talk to a lot of different entrepreneurs and innovators, and again and again, they hit upon this idea of learning. And they don't just mean knowledge acquisition. They actually mean learning how to learn, as in learning how to design things in new ways, how to come up with totally new gestures or languages or patterns, just a lot of new learning and also how to unlearn, how to get rid of old processes or assumptions or things that no longer serve us. And this always reminds me of uh, Leonardo da Vinci's sort of life. If we think about it, he was the perfect blend of artist and scientist. And we're going to need both. So from artistry, we need the capabilities of design. We need to be able to think of new things, like this is a design he did for a flying machine, a sort of future helicopter. We need to be able to come up with these creative ideas. And then we actually need to be able to put them through this system we're starting to automate. All of these transactions and um, supply chain dynamics and AI that we're using, this sort of middle transactions in our trade. We can test out a lot of our ideas by prototyping them much more quickly in those processes and then tinker with those ideas and, and be a scientist about it, figure out which ones are working and which aren't. So this is true not just for humans. Humans aren't the only ones who are going to need to learn and unlearn. We're going to be paired with machines and organizations in very new ways to create and drive value together. So I know this is a lot, and it sounds maybe like I am describing a better future, or I think it's better. And I, I don't actually think that, but I do think it's inevitable. It's inevitable in the same way that our inevitability was to transfer from being agrarian types of people to having a totally globalized trade system. It's inevitable in the same way that we went from globalized trade via institutions to digitizing all of that activity. So blockchain is this next inevitability. It's unlocking a much more decentralized way for not only humans to do business with each other, because we can automate a lot of those rudimentary business structures, but we can actually leverage that for machines to do business and for humans and machines to work together. So I hope you'll think about 
how you're going to be an artist scientist in this future decentralized economy. Thank you so much. The College of Knowledge, Tomorrow Conversations.